So look with me, if you would, um, at John chapter 6, and we'll, we'll start in verse 22, but you're going to read all the way through 59. So it'll take us a minute. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread and uh, after the Lord had given thanks. And we're going to look back actually at verses 1 through this portion in a minute. Verse 24 so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, um, they themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And this verse transitions into the point of the text, but you needed a little bit of background to know that these people were following Jesus for this reason. Jesus knows they want to eat. And that's important to understand that and to keep that in mind, the temporary food throughout the whole text and the message. Jesus says then in verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So do you see um, a, 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 a difference in what they are thinking and what Jesus is thinking? Yeah. There, there's a difference here. They're not, on, they're not tracking together, as we say. Mm -hmm. Okay, but Jesus is gonna correct that and he's trying to get them on his track. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Now, they're, 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 they're coming right into Jesus' hand. They're, they're asking questions that get them right where Jesus wants them, if you're familiar with this text. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread to eat from heaven. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So you can see this conflict building. Terminology, we don't mean the same thing by the words we're using here, okay? We're not talking about the same kind of manna from heaven. Verse 34, they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whosoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whosoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I should raise him up at the last day. So the Jews grumbling about him, uh, grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They're, they're frustrated at this conflict. They remember the historical Moses event. 
And Jesus is contending with it, seems to be contending with it. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Their perplexity builds. He goes on. Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me except the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. We've introduced a new issue here, verse 44. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. He's building himself up as that one. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Now, here's that strong statement again. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. Now, Jesus is drawing a contrast. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Wait a minute. This doesn't make sense. I mean, if they ate manna and died, are you gonna give us the bread that we can eat and not die? I mean, have you ever taken Lord's Supper and you know you would live on that the rest of your life? Do you need to stop eating since accepting Christ? I mean, this isn't making sense. Let's face it. But it actually does make sense, and that's what we hope to draw out today. This is the bread of that comes from heaven, verse 50, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Now he just opens up the secret. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever and the bread that I will give him for the, for the life of the world is my flesh. Boy, this just got weird, didn't it? If you're thinking with their ears, the Jews then disputed among them saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? It's starting to sound like John chapter three. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is why some people now believe that taking Lord's Supper is either transubstantiation or consubstantiation. It either is literally the body and blood of Jesus when the priest or whoever blesses it, or it becomes um, the body and blood of Jesus literally as it's consumed, which both are wrong. I'm just letting you know this is one of the reasons why some people hold to that theory, okay? but that's not what he's talking about. You and I both know that. Whoever feeds, verse 54, on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so... Whosoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not the bread, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught them at Capernaum. So you can kind of understand these people's bewilderment, because if you're like me, you've probably read John chapter six many times, and these questions keep occurring. What is Jesus talking about him? I mean, we understand by faith, you know, receiving Jesus as Savior and that kind of thing, but this is pretty graphic language, and we'd like to really kind of understand what Jesus means by what he's saying here. That's what I hope to help us see this morning. At this reading, Jesus has not yet taught what we think of as communion or Lord's Supper. This will come later on. But at the Last Supper, you can understand now why these, these people, his disciples, would have understood what he was doing at Lord's Supper because of this text. 
they, they would say, oh, I remember Jesus talking about that, okay? So that's what's going on here. Let's pray and ask the Lord to, to bless uh, his word. And then we'll, we're gonna actually walk through this just line by line. So you're gonna wanna keep your eyes on your Bible a lot this morning. Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you that though our hearts of stone uh, don't often understand with the clarity we would like the truths of your word, that when you open it up to us, it, it is not only obvious, it, it is real in a way that we could not have known or understood before. And Father, I pray that for your word this morning, that believers would better understand, um, comprehend what Jesus is saying in this text, and that especially if there is anyone here who is unconverted, that they might understand that their eyes of faith may be opened and that you would um, bless that to the point of regenerating them and removing that heart of stone. Father, we just ask that um, you bless your word in ways that you see fit and that as we read it and try to understand it and as we take Lord's Supper, we will have um, an abiding intimacy with you through your son that he told us to have and he offered to us. Just please do in the work uh, the work in the hearts of each of us as you see fit. I do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, um, I get a little bit of a kick out of watching the news, especially this week, because there's some, this week or two, there has been more hubbub about the word fight than I have, you could have ever imagined. And different people use the word and they mean different things. But when, when I watch the news, especially when I watch different or conflicting, competing views of, about what's going on in the political world, it's always interesting to me Whenever I, I hear a newscaster who's supposed to have been to journalism school not understand certain linguistic techniques. And I, I mean, I'm, I hated English. I, I couldn't tell you the eight parts of speech. Verbs, nouns, adverbs, proverbs. <laughs> I mean, I, I really can't. I think there's eight parts of speech. I couldn't tell you what they are. But, but I know hyperbole when I hear it. Don't you? I know a euphemism when I, when I hear it. I, I, know an, I know what an exaggeration is, but there's people that make millions of dollars a year on TV that are supposed to be telling the world what certain things that happen in the world mean, and they don't seem to know what hyperbole is. If you don't know what hyperbole is, let me just give you um, a, an example from a few different rhetorical devices. A euphemism, by definition, is a softer way to make a hard statement. You'll recognize this. If somebody says to you, I'm gonna have to let you go, what does that mean? You're fired. Here's your pink slip, right? You're gone. Uh, if, if, if somebody passes away, what does that mean? They die. They pass away. Um, what's another word for, you say, okay, uh, this is, it's just, I got it because it's e economical. Cheap. <laughs> it was cheap. You know, that's me. I'm, I'm in the, I'm, wherever the clearance sign is, that's where I'm at. That's the first place I go. All right. So, for example, in John 11, 11, um, this is biblical. After these sayings, uh, after saying these things, he, Jesus said to them, uh, our friend Lazarus, 
has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. What does that mean? He's dead, but I'm going to go bring him back to life. But he kind of softened the blow with this euphemism. So now euphemisms are biblical, right? Hyperbole. Hyperbole is a figure of speech that is excessive. So if I say, I have a ton of papers to grade, does that mean I have 2,000 pounds worth of papers to grade? Because that's what I just said. Now, if I were to say to you, man, I got a ton of papers to grade. Would you think that I've got 2,000 pounds worth of paper to, to go over? No. If you do, there's a problem. I mean, because nobody, and I don't want, you know, everybody's got that much common sense. Somebody says, I'm dying of starvation. They're very hungry. I've told you a million times. Wow, a million's a lot. Nobody has told anybody anything a million times. I'm pretty sure of that. Trust in Jesus with all your heart. Somebody says to you, hey, trust Jesus with, with your heart. What, what do you think that means? Well, it, it, it's, it, it's a hyperbole. It, it's, it's a figure of speech. So in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, well, does the heart believe? I mean, does this muscle have the capacity to exercise faith? No, it's a muscle. In, in, in a real sense, it's inanimate, even though it's beating, you know? But, but there's, there's, there's the seat of emotion in me. There's the soul of me that believes. And so I say, I have trusted Christ with my heart. And everybody knows what you mean by that. Who, who doesn't know what you mean by that? Hold, I, I, instead of answering it, just hold on to the thought. Because this really becomes part of the conversation between Jesus and these people later on. You're going to ask yourself, why don't they get it? How about a metaphor? And this is the last one. Because I know you're tired of English class. Someone says, I'm feeling blue. Well, that doesn't mean you're a smurf. <laughs> it means you're discouraged, depressed, down. She was fishing for compliments. <laughs> you know? You light up my life. Just get Debbie Boone out of your mind now. Because I know that she's in there. Right? You make me happy. You make me glad. You give goodness to my life. All right? How about you're the apple of my eye? Psalm chapter 17 and verse 8, the psalmist says, keep me as the apple of your eye. It's really the center. It's the core. We think of it as a pupil. It means to, to stay focused on me. You know, keep me the main thing, you know. But, but, but if somebody says, you're the apple of my eye, you know what they mean by that, right? Do you know what they mean by that, right? I wasn't asking for your verbal affirmation. I'm trying to emphasize the point that we know what people mean when they use rhetorical devices. But sometimes, and it, and, and it bothers me, People will make a bone of contention because you used a rhetorical device. And I ask myself, what's wrong with you if you don't understand what the common person who heard that statement would have understood? Why don't you get it? Because, see, that's where the problem is. It's not that you don't know how to use a rhetorical device. It's not that they don't understand rhetorical devices. It's because they don't want to get what you're laying down. They don't want to get it. That's the problem. That's why every one of you understood every one of those things I was saying. Linguistic tools are used biblically. They're used by us publicly. So I want to walk through this text with us this morning. And I'm going, to, I'm going to read verses 1 through 25 and make a couple 
of observations. But then after verse 25, from verse 26 to 29, I want to give like a running commentary because I'm hoping that that will help us see some things that, that really help us understand this text, but help us see what's the problem with the people who are rejecting what Jesus is trying to get across to them. That, that's kind of my main point this morning. And it'll matter when we take Lord's Supper. And it'll matter whether we trust Christ or not. So go back with me to John chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because, now hold this one, this is a point I want to make, because, um, let me find out where I'm at here. Um, I think I went too far. Because, they saw the signs he was doing. Now, that's important to understand here. They saw Jesus do some miraculous things. And a large crowd was following him because of that. Then verse 3, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now, the Passover feast, this is important, uh, of the Jews was at hand. So it was coming up, and Jesus is taking an opportunity here for a teachable moment. Lifting up his eyes then, verse 5, and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said to this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus isn't just saying, hey, I have a teachable moment here. Jesus, is, Jesus, we don't know how long in eternity past, knew that this teachable moment was coming. And he's going to make full use of it. I mean, he's going to really throw down some heavy stuff here. This is an important text. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? And you can understand that. You would be thinking the same thing. I mean, let's not be pious about this. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. 5,000, if we have 200 here, was that 25 times the amount of people that are here today? That's a lot of people, okay? Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. That's the miracle. And when they had eaten their full... He told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. So you can see the miracle there. They took up a whole lot more than they even had to give out. So this, is, this kind of sets the stage for the, the reality of a miracle being involved with bread. That's important. Because it's about to play out in a really, a truly, or a miraculously true way. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Well, at this point, it looks like Jesus really doesn't need to do anything more. I mean, wouldn't we say that they got it? They must see him as Messiah. They must believe. That's what John seems to be suggesting here. The people understood he was the prophet, the Messiah. But did they? Verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew himself 
to the mountain by himself, to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into the boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. Now it was dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. Uh, the sea became rough because of the strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land which they were going on the next day, this kind of comes back into what we're talking about. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea, you know, the ones that realized he was the prophet and the one that he said were following him so that they could have food, the multitude who saw all the signs. On the next day, that crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered into the boat, or they knew Jesus had not entered into the boat, but went up to the mountain with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread and the Lord had given thanks. So the crowd, so when the crowd that uh, Jesus uh, saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, why do you think they were seeking Jesus? Could it be that they're looking for breakfast? I mean, that seems to be what the text intimates. It, could it be that they're looking for, you know, to see the miracle man again? Because they believe he's a great prophet, right? So they're, maybe they're following the spectacle, right? And when they had found him on the other side, they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? And now Jesus re-enters into the text that we read earlier and he starts laying out for them this truth about spiritual heavenly manna. And this is where we'll start walking through it just a little bit at a time. So in verse 26, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. These people, and Jesus seems to know it, are willing to trade the miraculous for the mundane. They, they simply want something to eat. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting something to eat, but that seems to be their primary motive. Their motive doesn't seem to be recognizing Jesus as the prophet and gleaning from his teaching but what can you do for me? Now, I, I'm not gonna go into every nuance of every one of these verses. We just don't have time for that. I'm just trying to make some points here. So in verse 26, it appears that they're looking to trade the miraculous for the mundane. Then in verse 27, Jesus really gives them a command. He says, don't work for the food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him the Father has set his seal. This is a command, the idea of work is imperative. It's a continuous motion, a continuous action. So he says, don't be working for. Don't continue this pursuit of working for mundane. He's, he's starting to indict them or call them out. You're looking for the mundane things. That's, what, that's all you're after, if you will. Jesus wants them to be after more than that. But then he says something very interesting in verse 27. He says, but for the food that endures for eternal life. And, and then he says, the, 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 the son of man will give you. And then he points out that the son of man has the seal of the father. So what he's saying here is, this is an exclusive offer. This is what they do on TV. Hey, this is an exclusive offer. You and you alone can get this. This is for you. There's exclusivity to this. This isn't just for everybody. This only comes from Jesus. And not only is it an exclusive off, uh, uh, offer, but it comes from the authorized dealer. 
God put his seal on the son and only the son, because he has the commission from the father, can do what Jesus is trying to do here. So we're continuing to build up. God alone is the authorized agent of this exclusive offer. Then in verse 28, 28. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? This is the natural, and all of us have it, legal tendency. What must I do? You know, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said the same thing. This finds its genesis in Genesis when, um, and we talked about this in Sunday school, when Cain and Abel brought their offerings before the Lord and, and, and Cain brings the, the work of his hands. Every one of us take pride in what we can do and what we have done. God, don't you want my best? And God's answer is a resounding, no. And that, it kind of hurts our feelings. God's not interested in your best. Your best isn't near good enough. What he wants is Jesus. What he wanted was blood in the Old Testament, in Genesis. What he wants is the blood of Christ. And anything other than that will not work. Obedience really does matter. But all of us have this legalistic tendency to where we want to do something. We want to bring something. Verse 29, if you will look back with me there. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe. Whoa, this is important. Because they're thinking, what can I do? Jesus translates their do into a faith. A believe, this is what you can do, not do, but believe, trust. This is where the conflict be begins. This is where Cain failed. This is where religion fails, whether it be back then or whether it be in our day. Verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? You see, their, their emphasis still is on some kind of demonstrative action. They want some kind of work to be done. And if you go back to verse 26 again, they had seen signs before. And they want signs again because to them, that's verification. Now you see why your friends don't want to believe by faith, but they want to hear facts all the time. The, the problem they had, these people had is the same problem our friends have. It's the same problem we had. Signs don't satisfy. Just to let you know, in, in case you are th thinking that signs do, they, they only do for the moment but there's no life in them. They don't satisfy for good. Verses 31 and 32, the people said, our fathers, now they're gonna to try to use a little bit of leverage against Jesus. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And it's almost like, can you do that? Jesus said unto them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Now Jesus is starting to qualify this bread that he's given them, and a correlation and a contrast is made between the bread types, the manna in the Old Testament as opposed to a true bread. So remember now, you gotta stick with this. You gotta maintain these mental images and the word play that's going on here because Jesus is helping them see this contrast and where one fails and the other one fulfills but satisfies. And this is gonna be important when it gets down to the spiritual side of these things. He's building up to it, okay? The contrast between givers of bread and types 
of bread. In verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down and gives life to the world. So now this heavenly bread is identified. Jesus doesn't say it's him yet, but it's identified as a he. It's a, it's a person. Now, don't you know that their minds have got to be thinking, whoa, th th this is weird. There's something wrong here. This is starting to get increasingly difficult. And quite honestly, it's the difficult that many times people are faced with when they consider Christianity. I mean, who can understand God being a man? Uh, who can understand uh, Jesus dying on the cross as God being separated from God the Father? I mean, these things, are, they're, they're bigger than us. So you can understand their perplexity. Perplexity is not a problem. Unfaithfulness or being without faith is a problem. Developing and growing in your faith is good. Verse 34. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Now, doesn't this sound just like the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Give me this water that I don't have to come back and draw. I mean, hey, let's face it. If, if somebody could give you a food that either didn't ever go away or was replenished even as you ate it, like the miraculous food here. Now, just for fun, what would you choose? Like, I'm thinking baklava <laughs> or ice cream. You know, because like, I could eat ice cream the rest of my life, I think. Just please not liver. But you, you know, if you could just eat, you know, every time you take a bite of that ice cream, it just goes back, you know? Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like to not have to go to the grocery store again? Wouldn't you like to not have to cook anymore? Wouldn't you not like to not have to clean anymore? But that's a crazy thought. That's what these people are seeming to be thinking. This is a strange request. Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. If he just stopped right there. But graciously, he goes farther than that. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, if you don't understand the spirituality of this food, well, then you can see where this doesn't make sense. They don't get it yet, but Jesus graciously is going to keep working with them, and that's what I'm hoping that we'll see as he keeps working with them if we haven't ever seen it before, and we'll get it for what it really is. Jesus is the bread of life. I know you know that phrase. But how is it that we don't hunger or thirst having Christ? He satisfies. A person looking for religion, if they find Jesus, they stop looking because they're satisfied. All their... They may not understand everything yet, but their spiritual need is met. The need that man has had ever since Adam's fall. He's got this void that can't be filled. But in Christ, all of a sudden, it's filled. That's why they don't hunger or thirst anymore. That's why when you found Christ, you didn't try out Islam or Buddhism or Shintoism. Or anything else. You stopped. You were satisfied. In Christ. Verse 35 is another I am statement. This is an open invitation as well. Whoever comes can have this bread. Here's eternal sanctification. Satisfaction. And security. In Christ, this is obviously not about earthly food and they can't deny that reality. Whatever Jesus is talking about, he's not talking about either manna that comes down from heaven that's got to be picked up every day or fresh baked bread. Verse 36. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Now that's the problem because they have seen him. 
And whatever it is they believe about him is not exactly right yet because they, they, they saw him do miracles and they want to follow him, verse 26 again, to see these miracles. They're following. But they're following for wrong reasoning. Not that they don't believe he can do miracles, but they don't believe him to be the bread of life. So an accusation is made against them. In verses 37 through 40, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out eternal security. For I have come down from heaven and do not, uh, excuse me, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That doesn't mean it wasn't Christ's will to save. It, it, what he's doing is putting the impetus back on the Father. And, and you see he does this throughout his ministry, always giving the Father credit and glory. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but I should raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You know, you're starting to think, well, you know, you can stop the conversation right there because we just laid out the essentials of the gospel. Believe in, trust in him as Messiah. So God's making an eternal commitment to those people who will come and they will not be cast out. None are lost, but all are raised up. Verses 41 through 46. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, now they're trying to look for a loophole. They're trying to pivot. They're trying to demonstrate that that can't be true. We know where you came from. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? We've seen them before. We know where you were raised. We know where your house is, if you will. How does he now say, I came down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. If, if, if you sense a, a movement in your heart towards Christ when you hear these words, <clears throat> it behooves you to positively respond to that. And though you may not understand it, you call on Christ by faith, trusting in him, believing in him, as he said. Because this is God the Father drawing you, and your appropriate response is to give in by faith. But there are people, maybe in our pews right now, maybe in the world right now, that as they hear these words, they're resisting. Like the person who doesn't understand hyperbole. Like the person who doesn't understand what an exaggeration is. Like they, they're making out like they don't understand what it is. They do. You understand this. You resist it because you don't want it. And it'll be to your doom. It's like the person on CNN, who says, well, they wanted to go to the Capitol and fight. Well, you think they meant invade the Capitol, and I'm just using it, let's not be political. But you, but you don't see it that way when the person on your side says, we're going to fight for abortion rights. All of a sudden, you know what that means. But if you say, we're going to fight for liberty, all of a sudden, that's, you know, words of war. You're an idiot. I'm not trying to be mean, but you're acting like an idiot. That's, idiot's a biblical word. It's like moros. It's moron. It's a biblical word. And we can, we can be that way. Because the Bible says, even the fool says in his heart, we don't go around calling people fools, but the fool says in his heart, there's no God. When he knows there's a God, that's why he's a fool. Don't be a moron. Don't be a fool. You know what hyperbole is. You know what a metaphor is. You hear it. 
Right now. As it is written, verse 45, in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God, everyone who has heard and learned of the Father, from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, we haven't, except he who is from God, which is Jesus, he has seen the Father. We haven't even seen Jesus. But we trust in Jesus with our heart by faith. Is, is some of this starting to come to reality? Are you picking up on the picture Jesus is laying down about manna? Being spiritual food and eating his body? Verse 47, they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whom, who's our father and mother we know, our, whose father and mother we know? Verse, uh, that's verse 43. Verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, and this is an important text, whoever believes has eternal life. And then again in verse 48, he gives an I am statement. I am the bread of life. I mean, he's just being very, very bullet statement clear and adamant affirmation of who he is, no getting around it. Now, if you want to call him a liar, help yourself, but you can't get away from what, what, the, the truth of his statement. Verse 49. <clears throat> it's a promise. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. They didn't have the promise offered to them, the same promise offered that these people have being offered to them right now. They had a temporary offer. It was a completely different operation, a completely different thing. Jesus being the real manna, as opposed to whatever they ate, is Jesus' point. Don't be looking for, don't be thinking, I am that. I am different. I, I, I am eternal. Verse 50, this is the bread that comes down from heaven. It's the hymn. So that one may eat of it and not die. Eating Jesus body and drinking Jesus' blood is believing in and trusting on him. It's not con carne. It's not literally eating the flesh. It's not cannibalism. It's, it's a complete assimilation. Like, like when you do eat meat and, that, and it breaks down and assimilates into your body and it, it causes blood vessels to work and muscles to work and fat in the brain to operate so that you can think and a bazillion other things. That's what comes from that energy you, because you've assimilated it into you. But that's the physical side. The spiritual side is, is as well when you assimilate it into you, but by faith, it does all that, but eternally, not temporarily. Fifty-one again gives an "I am" statement. I am the living bread. At this point, a non-skeptic who is not bent on rejection of what Jesus is saying here, would understand what Jesus is teaching them and telling them. It's the person who understands what you mean by using the word fight or whatever else. In verse 52, the Jews then disputed amongst themselves how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're not getting it, or they're willingly resisting it. But maybe we should be patient with them, at least for a little bit, just as we were with Nicodemus 
in John chapter three and verse four, when he said, how can a man be born when he is old? It's very interesting to note that it was apparently not then, but later on that Nicodemus came to Christ. And it may very well be that Lord Willa and some of these people later on came to Christ. And that's what we hope for whenever we preach the word, that even if a person doesn't come to Christ today, God the Holy Spirit will so continue to draw and move on their heart that they will come to Christ. That's why we pray. God, move in their heart, draw them to yourself. That's why I was, somebody asked me if I was angry last week. Well, I wasn't angry at anybody. It's kind of angry at sin, you know. That's why, we, that's why I pray for my kid. And if you have a lost kid, boy, I can't imagine if you're not praying for him. I just can't imagine that. They're disputing, verse 53. We see a new intimacy, that assimilation. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is that new intimacy to become a part of a person or a thing. But there's a qualifier here, unless, except that, you accept this. This acceptance is essential and fundamental. If you don't do this, you don't get that. This is the crux of the matter and where it gets serious Verses 54 through 56. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, um, excuse me, I was in verse 25. Verse 54. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And this is the same word abide that Jesus used in John chapter 15, talking about continuing to abide in him. Verses 55 through 58. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I uh, live because of the Father, whoever feeds on me, he also will live, catch this, because of me. It's not because of Moses. It's not because of what Moses taught or that historical event. The impetus is again on him. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whosoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus taught these things in the synagogue. So here's the unveiling of this matter. The revelation, the discovery of this truth. And that is that Jesus' body and his blood or the genuine article, and that an acceptance, an assimilation of them by faith is what Jesus meant by when he said, eat my body and drink my blood. It's still an act of faith. In John chapter 17, verses 23, 23, Jesus is praying to the Father And he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, through the apostles' word, that they may all be one. Watch this. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world might believe that you have sent me. This... Uh, the, uh, sent me the glory that you gave me, I have given to them that they may be one even as you and I are one. Now, are you and I one? 
Not not in the sense that we're like connected, like, you know, all the time, 24-7, 365, but we are one in Christ. So in Christ, we are one with him and the Father. And then in verse 23, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly, holy, fully, truly, one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you loved me. So we already in Christ experience this oneness, this, this unity. So when I say, you know, Brother Darren, that's because we're unified. But I couldn't say that to an unconverted person because they're not one with me. They're not in Christ with me. So I hope that 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 has helped us out. And I want to give one more thing before we take Lord's Supper. I want you to look at four different verses because Jesus, if you noticed, four times in this text, he said, truly, truly. Did you notice that? When, when, when someone says truly, truly, they, what they're about to say is very important. It's a strong statement. So in verse 25, we read, um, verse 20, uh, excuse, excuse me, verse 26, truly, truly, I say to you, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. What Jesus did there was discover the heart and the motive of them. Now, that was actually a very gracious act on his part because he's helping them see their situation unavoidably. And it's good to know when you're wrong, right? So you can get it right, right? Right? Jesus is very gracious to do this. Then in verse 32, firm fact number two, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. No matter how great a man is, and Moses was great, Abraham was great, David was great, no man can give eternal life. There's one mediator between God and man. So in case you're a religious person and you think that a priest can somehow bestow to you eternal life, he cannot. Thirdly, verse 47, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Firm fact number three is that all those who put their faith in the Christ have eternal life. Now, now, you know, as I look out of this crowd, like most of you already know this, and you're probably thinking, hey, preacher, we already know that. But, but it's important that people know this. I know that you know, but it's important that you know and that other people know. In verse 53, firm fact number four, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh, the flesh of the son and drink his blood. You have no life in you. That's just opposite of verse 47. If you do this, you have it, but, but if you don't, that, that's an important reality to understand. Failure to assimilate Jesus by faith is rejection of him and will, return, will result in eternal death. So I hope, I know it took a while, but I hope that just walking through that John text will help us better understand what Jesus means by what he is saying about taking on his body and taking on his blood as the true manna from heaven because food gives life. Jesus Christ gives life. 